So today we're digging into James 2, 14 to 26. Today's passage is perhaps the core passage of James. It's certainly the passage that's been argued about the most through the centuries. James today is talking to us about the connection between our heart, our faith, what's going on in, in, in the belief area of our lives and the, the ways that we actually act in our external lives, our words, our actions. And of course, Jesus says you can tell a tree by its fruit, and he's talking about people, but you know, you can see good fruit, and you can tell it's a good tree, and you can see bad fruit and tell it's a bad tree. But, but we've also got to recognize that we have a choice. Even when we believe something, even when we believe something, for it to make its way out into our life, there is still a choice. So in a general way, you can look at somebody and you can see the kind of car they drive and the way they talk and the way they treat their family and their friends. And you get a sense of what kind of tree they are. But still in those, in those individual situations, we, we get to decide if, if we're going to let our faith come out and be completed in our real lives. I remember a couple of decades ago, I was at a uh, camp that had a, a high ropes course. And I don't know if you get into high ropes or not, but high ropes are a place where your, your, your belief and your action are brought into tension. Many, many times I've been at the top of a zip line and uh, there's nothing inside of me. I believe the zip line will hold me. I believe the harness, though uncomfortable, will keep me from plunging to my death. But I sit there and my body is telling me, don't do it. Don't, don't jump off the ledge. I remember being at this camp a couple decades ago where there was a, a gentleman who was part of our church maybe 50 years old, 55 years old, and as a part of a team exercise, he had to do, I don't know what it was called, but it's, it's this high ropes element where you climb up about half a, half a telephone pole, maybe uh, 10, 12 feet up in the air, and then you stand on top of the telephone pole, and you're, you're harnessed in, you know, you got, a, you got a thing going to a wire or whatever, and then there's a tennis ball out there that if you really put your heart into it and you're a normal-sized person with normal-sized muscles, you can just barely slap this tennis ball. And this man got up there, and he had a professed fear of heights, but he, he wanted to be part of the team. He wanted to get the points for his team, so he climbed up, and he stood there. And he knew. He's a very intelligent man. He knew his harness would hold him. He knew that wire was good. He had watched countless people do this before him. But he stood up there, and he, he just could not do it. He just stood and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. He didn't climb down, but he didn't jump off because in his heart he knew this is completely safe. But he was struggling to make that choice to actually act on what was inside of him. So our external lives flow from our internal lives, but we, but we get to choose. We get to choose what we're going to do. And, and, and James says a lot of things in today's passage to connect our deeds, our works with our faith. He says in verse 14, what good is it if you claim to have faith but have no, need, uh, have no deeds? He says in verse 17, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. He says in verse 20, faith without deeds is useless. 24, he says, you see, a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In verse 26, he says, faith without deeds is dead. So it's great that you know that the harness will hold you if you're going to jump. But does that belief make any difference in your life unless you actually go ahead and jump? And for you and for me, the question today is, what, is, what are our lives and our choices revealing about our hearts? When Jesus called his disciples, they had two options to say no, to decline. No, thanks, Jesus. Or to get up and follow him. There was no sort of option three on the table that a lot of us try to live in, which is to affirm Jesus' teaching, but sort of say, I'll catch up with you later, Jesus. I'm, I'm up to some things right now. And, and so it is with us. Jesus beckons us to leave our old lives, to abandon the sin that is killing us, and to get up, to move, to act, to obey, to choose life in him. Because this is what it means to follow Jesus, not just to acknowledge him as the truth, although that's the beginning, but, but to let that lead us to follow Jesus as also the way and the life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Today, three truths from James which call us to live with integrity, 
where our daily lives match up with the things that we profess to believe. James challenges us to move beyond self-deception, to, to look at our lives, to see who we really are, and to move today towards understanding more deeply and living out more thoroughly the gospel that is saving us. So I'm going to make three key points today and pull out three truths, but throughout this passage, there's, there's just a number of examples. James essentially lays out all five examples that, that help us get our heads around what he's actually trying to talk about. And the first thing, the, the first example we see, verses 14 to 17, he writes, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the, the, their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, Faith itself, is, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Big truth number one, true faith results in deeds flavored <laughs> with mercy and compassion. If there's true faith in our hearts, it will come out in our lives in actions of mercy and compassion. James is saying, and he, he keeps coming back to this theme, that justice work, the work of setting things back right in this world is a key sign that God is active in our lives. He said in an earlier passage, this is real faith, to look after widows and orphans in their need. He said in last week's passage, if we have real faith, we will not discriminate against people of lower social status. And now he's saying, if we have real faith, we will actually help people who have helps, uh, who have needs, excuse me. In 1 John, John writes, if anyone has material possessions, sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. In one of Jesus' most intense parables, the sheep and the goats, he, he separates people based on, did they care for those in need? Did, did their faith actually spring into action? He says, you know, when you care for the, the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're actually caring for me. And when you ignore them, you're ignoring me. And James starts here, the, the second point I'm going to make is a broader point, but James starts with this narrow focus on justice bringing, simply to, to push at us, to, to recognize at the outset of this passage, that it lacks integrity to receive God's rescue in our time of need and not help others in their time of need. This, this is the core reality of who we are as followers of Jesus. We are those who have been rescued. We have been rescued by God. And he, he didn't just rescue us with his words. He didn't just say, yeah, you're good to go. Don't worry about it. You're forgiven. He, he rescued us through the, tragic, through the tragedy, the tragic action of, of allowing his son to be killed for our sin and then rising him to new life. It wasn't just by words that God saved us. It was through action. And, and words don't go far enough for a brother or sister in need. Keep warm and well fed. There, there is action required. If I continually say I love you to my family, but each and every time that one of them comes up and says, hey, can you help me with this? Can we do this? What do you think about this? I say, you know, no, 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 I don't, I don't have time right now. Over time, you start to ask the question, do I really love them? And I've loved the way that I have seen over the last number of years the, the faith of my brothers and sisters at Central pour out into the lives of others. I've, lo I've loved it when I've seen mercy and compassion flow. And it happens so often in very small ways. In, in a conversation in the foyer where somebody is crying and people begin to gather around and pray and hold and hug. I've seen it at place, places like the mustard seed. Where, where people gather up and make some food and go, go help out. I've seen it in international contexts where, where teams go to Romania or, or Belize or Mexico or other places and, and there's need in front of them and, and the heart of Jesus Christ springs up and they respond. And James is saying to us about these things, beautiful, but, but what about right here? What about in our real lives? Not just in intense and special environments, but today 
in here. What does this look like? And we have a, we have a unique and special opportunity, actually, with COVID. I, I was so encouraged to see about 140 households sign up for neighbor groups, about 400 people in those households. Just this opportunity just to know and to care and support and to have eyes to look out to the community beyond and consider how we can shine God's light. I want to say to you, this is God's heart. And this is how God's act, God acts. His love springs into action. And James is saying to us, if we have real faith, there will be real deeds. Do your actions reveal a heart of mercy and compassion? This is the question James is asking us. And then we see another example in uh, verses 20 to 24. This example of, uh, of Abraham. He, he writes, you foolish person. James talked pretty straight at his church. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Second big point here, true faith is visible in our choices, actions, and lifestyle. So he zooms out. It is about deeds of mercy and compassion, but it's it's really our whole lives that if there's real faith in us, it will become evidenced in how we choose and what we decide to do in, in our lifestyle. Now, if you are familiar with the Bible, (laughs) if you read it, you will hear in these words things that make you go, but what about what Paul said about faith being what we need to be saved? In Romans 3.28, Paul says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In Ephesians 2, he says, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God not by works so that no one can boast. James says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So if you're reading and exploring the full scripture, it's good not to ignore these points of tension and to to, to ignore what's going on here. It's good to ask the question. Now, some people at a very simplistic level can say, you know, well, the Bible disagrees with itself. You know, that's why I don't believe in it. If you actually dig into what James presents he believes or what Paul presents he believes or what John presents that he believes, there actually is a a very strong unity in the gospel. And one of the ways that we see this in this passage, interestingly, is that James quotes exactly the same verse as Paul to make his point. Paul, Paul had talked about how God saw Abraham's faith and credited it to him as righteousness, James quotes that very same verse. And he says, see, you need deeds, not just faith. What's going on here? Well, in Genesis 15, 6, we read that God saw Abraham's faith and he credited his faith to him as righteousness. In Genesis 22, This is where Abraham walks up the mountain. God has asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac that he's waited decades to have. And Abraham responds in obedience. He brings his son Isaac up the mountain and it's at the point where he's got the knife raised where God says, stop, stop, stop. And he actually provides in that place a ram caught in a thicket. And so what we're actually seeing here is is what happens over a track record of a person's life When faith is active, it's making the same point that Paul wants to make for his context and James for his context. So question for you, how do you get saved? Are you saved through faith or are you saved by works? And of course, the Bible answers this pretty clearly. It says neither. You're saved by grace. And as we put Paul and James together, we see that they align with the teaching of Jesus. That is the grace of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's grace that saves us. And the way we access that is through faith, through belief, through believing what God has done, recognizing and admitting we can't do it on our own. And as we live with this faith, it becomes works. And if it doesn't, 
it reveals that something is missing at the level of faith, and it calls into question if we have actually received God's grace. Paul's concern was people who were trying to obey their way to heaven, and he was saying, you can't get to heaven by obeying the law. It's too late already. James' concern was people who thought that belief without obedience was enough, and he wanted to say, if you have real saving faith, It will flow to obedience. But it's God's grace alone. Even when faith springs into godly action, it's still too late for for those actions to save us. They're talking about the same story, taking the same story of Abraham and applying it, that we could get a more full understanding of the gospel. But we could say this in another simple way. We could simply say faith becomes faithfulness. If you think about a marriage as an example, it's great that you claim that you have love in your heart and you stand up on the wedding day and you declare it to the world, you know, over your web stream with your iPad where your dad is walking you down the aisle. Have you seen anyway? But faith becomes faithfulness. Over time, that love that you profess is either proven or disproven by your actions. And this is what James is poking at. Over time, Is your faith showing that you are faithful to God or is it showing itself in a different way in your lives? And of course, a wedding is a good analogy because in the kingdom, it's all about relationship. When we believe and receive God's salvation, we come into relationship with him. And over time, faithfulness matters in a relationship. Over time, are we walking faithfully with Jesus? Are we making choices to put that faith into action in our real lives? Or we kind of hold that faith as fire insurance, just hoping that it'll somehow accomplish something in eternity, but continuing to live our lives without repentance in whatever direction we want. Practically through this theology, God can say to us simultaneously, number one, you can't work your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. All that's needed for salvation is found in Jesus. Just believe. But at the same time, don't stop with belief. Let it move to obedience. Don't, 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 don't just get right with God. Be useful. And he says this to, to pull this out. He actually talks about demons in verses 18 and 19. He says, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Listen to this. You believe that there is one God? Good. <laughs> Even the demons believe that and shudder. And so he's, he's kind of I think speaking in a good pastoral way, he's saying, if you have faith, if you're recognizing in your life, I have faith, but maybe it's not really flowing to action these days. He says, you know what? That's a good start. The call here is complete your faith. Get faithful with your faith. Make the choice, if you believe, to take what's in your heart and bring it into real life. And he references the demons to say, they know the truth, but they are not implementing that truth with their actions. Instead, they're rebelling against God, he says, add obedience so that your faith is useful. John Wesley used to say, let me wear out, not rust out. Let me not live to be useless. What do your choices, actions, and lifestyle reveal about the faith that you profess? True faith results in deeds flavored with mercy and compassion. It's visible in our choices and actions. And then we get to another example, example four, verse 25, the prostitute Rahab. It says, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave direction to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? I love that he goes to Rahab because Rahab speaks to you and it speaks to me if we would say, I want to complete my faith. I want to move from faith to action. Big point number three, true faith releases us from yesterday's mistakes into today's opportunities. James transitions from Abraham, the famous faith hero, to Rahab, the famous Canaanite sinner. And the point is for you and for me that God is ready to turn your story when you're ready to let him turn your story. There was a dormant faith in Rahab's heart that when when confronted with the reality of the coming of the Israelites, she turned her heart to God and became one of the Israelites. It's a time of planting seeds, and it is amazing. 
as we think and we look into our gardens and all around the world of these seeds that lie dormant. They're there. They're powerful. They have what is needed. But until we put them into the soil and start watering and giving them sunshine, they don't grow into what they were intended for. I read a story this week of a lotus flower, carbon dated, a seed, carbon dated to the year 1300 that was planted in 1995 and sprouted. And I want to just speak this to you. If you have a seed of faith, don't, don't, take this, don't take this message from James as an opportunity for new guilt and shame. Take it as an opportunity to let your seed of faith start growing today. Water it. Bring on the sunlight. Bring on the sunlight. And we do this by allowing the Holy Spirit into our life. He lands the passage with this verse. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We read in Ezekiel God's promise, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We cannot earn our way into heaven And we can't even obey and honor God in our own strength. But he, if we ask, he will pour his spirit into us to give us the right desires and the strength to obey. Will we continue to live as the people that we were yesterday and last year and decades ago? Or will will we decide by faith to begin to become today that person that God has created us to be? It's not, it's not about yesterday. We see in the story of Rahab, it's about today. Who will you be today? And this is the gospel. The gospel is an invitation to turn from lives lived for our own things headed to death into the life of Jesus Christ that springs up into eternal life. The call of James is don't just receive the gospel. Live it out. <laughs> and this is not drudgery. Abraham, it says, became through faith a friend of God. He walked his life with God. A few on-ramps to land today. Number one, what do your choices, actions, and lifestyle reveal about what you really believe in your heart? Second, what unique opportunities do you have today to show God's mercy and compassion to others? And third, today, Will you choose a life of becoming like Jesus by freshly receiving and relying on the power of his Holy Spirit? I want to pray for you before we go into one more song of worship, but I just want to come back to my friend standing on the high ropes telephone pole, beginning to shake, actually beginning to cry. 50-year-old man, tears coming down his face out of fear. But after literally about 10 minutes on the pole, (laughs) he closed his eyes and jumped with all of his might and slapped that tennis ball so hard. It was a beautiful thing. (laughs) He believed and he let it become action in his life and it changed his life. It, it, It was a significant, significant moment of courage where he overcame fear and stepped out into what he believed. Let me pray this for you. So Father, we wanna ask that you would give us those right desires and that you would give us the strength to actually step into the people that you, to, to becoming the people that you are calling us, that you have created us to become. God, we know it's not overnight, it's degree by degree, and we will not be fully like you until that day that we see you in glory. But I pray for each person who's participating that our hearts would be open and that for each whose hearts is open that you would You would fill them up with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill me up. Fill us up with fresh encouragement, fresh, good, godly desires, and fresh strength to complete our faith. Not to just lie with a dormant seed of faith in our hearts, but to let it spring up to new life. Water it, God. Bring your sunlight. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may bring glory to you, put a smile on your face, and be part of seeing your kingdom come among us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.